Good evening, friends. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. God. Lift up my soul. To your love trust, oh my God, do not let me be put to shame. Let my enemies triumph over me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Father God. Bless your name for this evening. For this evening, Lord, show me your way. Teach me your path. Guide me in truth. Lead me on, guide me on truth, and lead me on. Hallelujah, oh my Savior. Hope you see you. Moment of the day. Thank you, Lord. We'll never be put to shame. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. You help me, defend me, Lord, I need you. To you I lift up my soul, to you I lift up my soul. Hallelujah to you, Lord, I lift up my soul. No one whose hope is in you will never be put to, put to shame. That's why my eyes are on you, oh God. To you I lift up my soul. Thank you, Father God, that I have you as a father that I can lift my soul up to, Lord. We bless you, Father God. We worship you this evening. Lord, mercy and love, and they flow from the old. Remember your mercy, oh Lord. Remember your love that flows so for always, Lord. Remember me, oh Lord. Don't remember, oh God, my rebellious ways, Lord. Hallelujah, God. According to your love, remember me. According to your love, oh God. Yes, Lord, remember me. For you are good, oh Lord. Those one who will be seeing you. Will never be put to shame. No one whose hope is in God will ever be put to shame. That's why our eyes are on you, oh God. Surround me. Defend me, oh God. Oh Lord, I need you. To you I lift up my soul. To you I lift up my soul. To God whose hope is in you. Will never be put to shame. That's why my eyes are on you, oh Lord. Surround me, defend me, oh Lord, I need you. To you I lift up my soul. To you I lift up my soul. Ah, thank you, Father. No one whose hope is in God will ever be put to shame. Lord, that's why my eyes are on you, O oh God. Hallelujah. Surround me. Defend me. Lord, I need you. Hallelujah. To you I lift up my soul. To you I lift up my heart, O oh God. Hallelujah. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh Lord, I lift up my soul to you. Oh Lord, I lift up my soul to you. Oh Lord, I lift up my soul to you. Oh Lord, I lift up my soul. Hallelujah. To you, oh Lord, I lift up my soul. I see this song that I just shared with you this evening, you know, to begin our time of, um, you know, uh, discussion is one song that I sang almost every other hour at a time in my life when I was praying and trusting God, you know, for, for a change in that situation. You know, I was seeing, 
in Cairo. I was working in Cairo. I had gone there to do a project. I was um, um, I employed as an expert on a particular project. And we were faced with so many challenges in Egypt then on this particular project. It was, it was such a challenging time. And I was just asking God for his help that no one who puts their hope in you will ever be put to shame. And you do I trust, oh Lord. I trust in you. And I know that you are my helper. You, are, you, you, you will defend me in this place. You will surround me with your presence. And you will walk through this, th for me, through this issue for me. You know, when I came across the song and I started meditating on it, it really helped me to go through those challenging moments in my life that I can put my trust in God. I can keep my eyes on him. Even when everything around me seems to be going contrary, I can trust in God. And that's why I'm sharing it with you tonight because it's so relevant to the topic I'm going to be talking, you know, sharing with you this evening. Don't worry your prayers. Yeah, that is the topic. Don't worry your prayers. And possibly, me, what can that be? And I, I, I consider it. I ponder on it. So many times we pray and ask God for specific things. We have prayed all manner of prayers. We've done all that we know to do. And at the same time, our hearts are agitated. We are anxious. We are worried. We are just, you know, in, in a state of turmoil concerning that situation that you have already entrusted into God's hands, something that you have said, God, I can't do this on my own. I mean, God, I cannot handle this situation. God, I need your help in this situation. And yet we spend so much energy worrying after praying about this, the, the situation. We become so agitated in our spirit. We are restless. And you know, the Illustration that comes to mind each time I think I ponder on, you know, praying and worrying at the same time, and which is why I'm, took, you know, doing this topic tonight, not worrying our prayers. The, 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 what comes to my mind is the image of a farmer who has planted his seeds in the grounds. He has taught, you know, tilled the grounds. He has, um, has done all that, you know, tilled the grounds. It has watered it, it has put um, the fertilizer in it, and he now plants its seeds. And then he's now waiting for these seeds to germinate. He is not seeing the sprout, you know, coming out yet. And he begins to go and open it up and examine it, whether it is coming. It's actually the story of a child who was doing a school experiment in, um, um, I think it's planting and agriculture, and they were given, they were asked to plant seeds so that it, you know, they see how the, the seed would germinate and sprout and it will come out. And this child, he waited one day, nothing was happening, and he went to open up the soil to see whether the seed is still there, whether the seed is germinating. And honestly, that is exactly what it, it looks like and it feels like when we have... Um, when we are praying about something and we have entrusted it into God's hands and then we become so agitated, so restless that we cannot even sit still. How is it going to happen? Is it going to do it? Ah, you want to know exactly how God is going to bring this thing to pass. Honestly, we've all been there. But here's what the Bible tells us in, um, uh, yeah, it, in Proverbs 12, 25 about worrying and worrying our prayers and which is what i want to share with you is this first worrying weighs us down let's just first of all examine that word worry it weighs us down and i'm going to look at it from different translations the worrying the heaviness in the heart of a man makes him to stoop to droop you know you've prayed about this situation and then you begin to worry it you have you become you begin your shoulder stoops your head is bowed and everywhere you go people are looking at you and asking you what is the matter and then you're saying hey, is this situation and then you recount it over and over and over and over again and you're just wondering how is it ever going to come would it ever come the way i hmm. that is worrying it says that a man's, a person's anxiety weighs him down. Worry weighs us down. Worry, anxiety leads to depression. In fact, that's what the, 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 the English um, uh, 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 um, 
the, the conventional English translation says, is it the anxiety worrying your prayer leads to depression because you are so heavy in your heart. You are just, all you are thinking about is this situation. Ah, we did ever come to pass. Hey, we did ever turn out this way. And honestly, we've all been through it, but we must know where to draw the line between trusting God and, you know, anxiety and worrying about what we are trusting God to do for us. It will weigh down our hearts. That's what the Bible is telling us. The anxiety and worry, it brings, you you know, uh, 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 depression. In fact, the Passion Translation says that anxious fear, because honestly, what we are, we, what we are exhibiting when we are worrying our prayers is like, hmm, does God have the power to do this thing? Will God be able to do this thing? I know that is not our intention, but that is what our anxiety communicates. You know, you're just wondering, will God be able to do this the way that I want it to do? I want him to do it. I mean, would he be willing to do it? Is this what God would do for me? And the Bible, we know that the Bible tells us that God wants to do us good. And if what we are asking is in accordance to his will, we can be rest assured that he would do it for us in his own way, in his own time. So when we are worrying, we are anxious and we become so agitated in our spirit and our heart to the point that anxious fear grips our heart. And honestly, I have, it has happened to me several times and I, I have had to learn to caution myself to pull myself to order because who by worry can add a single centimeter to their lives i mean worry and i'm going to be talking a lot about this so that we know the the gravity of what worry can do for us it takes us totally contrary to the will and purpose of god Anxious fear brings de 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 depression, but a life-giving word of encouragement, a life-giving word of encouragement can do wonders to restore your joy. A life-giving word of encouragement can do wonders to restore your joy. And that's what I want to do tonight, to give you a life-giving word of encouragement based on the word of God, to restore joy to your agitated heart, to restore hope to your heart, because the more you are anxious and worried about the issue that you have presented before God, the more you give the enemy the opportunity to steal your joy. And that is what he wants to do. That is his uh, 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 terms of reference. That is his uh, 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 MOD, modus operandi. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to keep you depressed. He wants to keep you agitated. He wants to steal your rest. But you need to encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what David did in, in, in 1 Samuel 30. Everything that could go wrong had gone wrong. His village has been you know, ravaged. I mean, his wife and children have been taken away, kidnapped. I mean, it's just like those in the northern part of Nigeria where the Boko Haram come in and clean out the village, burn, kill, and take the people away. And he had every reason to be sorrowful. His whole team, all, all his men were sorrowful. But he chose in his sorrow to turn towards God. What choices did his, his, uh, his military men make? They wanted to stone him because they were so consumed with sorrow in their spirit. They were ready to stone David. But what did David do? The Bible recorded that he encouraged himself in the Lord. He he reminded himself of the goodness of God. He reminded himself of the faithfulness of God. He reminded himself that God is good. Come watch me. He turned towards God. So when we face situations that, I mean, there's been so many things that happened in 2020 that, you know, can give us the license to be worried. And we've prayed, we've prayed about COVID. It seems as if the cases are just going up and down. Then we're having second waves, third waves. And then we begin to get anxious. Is God listening? We're beginning to, you know, he can lead us. The minute we open the door and allow worry in, it leads us to begin to doubt God's power to make a difference, God's power to make a change, and God's power to take control of that situation. But one thing that I know for sure is that God has not abdicated on his throne. He is still on the throne. He is God in every circumstance, whether on the hill, on the mountaintop, or in the valley of the shadow of death, he is God. Whether we pass through with the waters of travail, whether we go through fire of oppression, God remains God. And the good news for us is that we are never 
alone. No matter what the circumstance may be that causes our hearts to be agitated, we are never alone. God says he is with us. We see that in the book of Isaiah. So let's go on. So when we are praying, what are we actually doing? As we bring this case before God to Jesus Christ and we lay it at his feet. They said, this is the situation, this is the circumstance I'm, th I'm faced with. Like the example that I, I, I gave at the beginning. I was facing severe challenges with a project I was employed to, 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 to oversee and to see to a, a, a logical conclusion. And everything that could go wrong was going wrong. I mean, it got to a point in the high, in, at the height of it, I became so ill that I had to return back to Geneva. One of my team members had a home accident and sustained second degree burn. Another one of my team members had an accident and you know, fractured his leg. Another one of my team members lost the, 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 the close sister that they lived together. They are both uh, um, uh, elderly sisters living together. It was like everywhere we turned was calamity in our personal life on top of the, the situation that we were facing with the work that we were asked to do. I knew that it is only God who could intervene for us. There is no way, there is no amount of worrying, there is no amount of anxiety that was going to change the situation. Or what it was going to do is to make me more morose, make me depressed, and I will lose my will, I will lose my ability to be able to do what God has called me to do. I will lose my ability to be able to hear the God's instruction in the midst of that situation. So we will not let, when we pray, we are surrendering the situation to God. I think it was yesterday I shared a post on this page. Prayer is surrender. Prayer is saying that, Lord, I hands off. Take it, do it whichever way. Not my will, but your will. That's exactly what Jesus said. That if it were possible that this cup of, of uh, uh, adversity, this cup of oppression, will pass over me. Lord, let, let me not drink from this cup of suffering. Of course, we know the intensity of the suffering that was ahead of Jesus. And he, 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 it touched him. He was human. He was God in human. He wept you know, and cried before God until the, the, the blood was coming down his face like, like beads of sweat. That was the intensity of the agony with which he was praying that this cup of suffering, this cup of oppression will pass over him. But as he finished that prayer, he, the way he finished was that, God, not, not my will, but your will be done. That no matter the outcome, you are the one who is going to get the glory. And it is a place that, it's a good place for us to pray, to be at, where we go to God in prayer, that we surrender that situation over to God, we lay the body at Jesus' feet. We don't go back and examine it. We just leave it there. God, you are going to take care of this. I'm going to focus on your word and on your promises. And I'm going to be speaking it over this situation. You see, the more we do that, I say, I can't, I, I mean, I, there is no, there's no way I can handle this situation. Prayer is my, is my first it's my, it's my default mood. And I, I, it's not my last resort. It's not my last line of defense. It's my first line of offense. I pray, I take it to God in prayer. And then I ask God, you know, to, you know, to, to help me to draw on the grace. I ask for the grace. I ask for the help of the Holy Spirit so that I can keep my focus on his word, on his promises, and not on the situation, not my current reality. I was sharing with a friend this afternoon, we were talking about entrusting our children to God and how God taught me that lesson that I do not have any control. I cannot watch over them myself. And I have to entrust them to God. It was when my son was preparing to go to, to the university in the United States. I calculated the number of kilometers away from home, 6,933 kilometers away from home. My first person, I, I mean, it's like, this is the farthest he's ever going to go away, you know, with, from us by himself. I cannot just jump on the plane and say, I'm going to see him. It's, I mean, 
you're crossing the Atlantic, you, it has to be planned. So you, 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 there is absolutely nothing I in my physical strength can do to watch over him. And then God reminded me that even when he was, you know, under my roof at that time, where he goes to school was my eye on him. Where he goes for his basketball, why my eyes on him? When he goes for the school trip, why my eyes on them? No, my, even when they are at home, can my eyes be on them 24 hours a day? When they're in their rooms and on their phones and all that, can my eyes be on them? No. And therefore, if I can entrust him into his, trust my sons into his hands to watch over them, when they leave home and walk to the bus stop, get on the bus and go to school, and he brings them safely back home. So why can't I entrust them into his hands if they have to go 6,900 kilometers away from home? Or the, the second one actually went 9,000 kilometers away from home, even further to the west coast of the United States. If I, was, if, if I want to kill myself with worry, I had, you know, the, the, the recipe was ripe. I mean, everything was in place if I, want to, if I want to worry to consume my heart. But no, I had to hold on to the word of God. And what God impressed on my heart then is that the best that I have planned for my children, my best, best desire for them, pales in significance compares to his good for them. And he is the one who can watch over them 24-7. So there's no amount of my worrying that's going to make a difference to where they are. And so I might as well leave them in God's hands and rest in God. My responsibility is to pray and uphold them before God, teach them the truth about the word of God, and trust that they will walk in the path of truth and righteousness. The Bible says, train up your child in the way to go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. So we fulfill our responsibility, teach our, parents, our children, train them, and then we leave them in God's hands. When it came to my health, Oh, they, I go to the doctors and they're giving me one report after the other. What, I mean, you, you, sometimes they finish speaking like this and you just wonder whether they just want you to go and jump into the lake. And then as soon as we're leaving the place, my husband is asking me, whose report are you going to believe? I said, I'm going to have to entrust my life into God's hands. There's so many times when I go for an investigation and they have to put me to sleep. And the, what I'm saying in my, in, you know, as I'm being put to sleep is, God, I entrust my life into your hands. I'm trusting you to wake me up, bring me back to the land of the living. That was my consistent prayer. And of course, when I was going to, you know, when I was eventually had to be in coma, I di didn't even have any sense at that point in time to be, to be praying. So whether I like it or not, my life had to be hid in God's hands. There was absolutely nothing I could do about what was going on around me in that time. And so my family, my husband and my sons have to commit me into God's hands and hold the hands of the altar on my behalf. And that's what we can do. We've got to entrust that situation into God's hands and leave it there and trust in his ability to be able to handle it. Especially when we have surrendered our will to him and say to God, whatever the outcome, Lord, you are God in this situation. Whatever the outcome, you remain good because you will never do evil. Everything you do is good and it is suffused with grace. That is in Psalm 145. Everything that God does is good and he infuses grace into it. And so when we pray with that attitude of surrender, that your will be done. There is the measureless grace of God that is released to sustain us and to strengthen us while we are in that waiting season, while we are waiting to see the outcome to our prayers. And that grace, it helps us to hold fast to God's truth. When all the anxious thoughts begin to come and knock at the door of our heart, then we can begin to speak to that anxious thought and say, this is what the word of God say concerning this situation. And so, to surrender means that we willingly yield ourselves to God's higher purpose. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, we're saying that it is God's, God's purpose will always be higher than mine. God's way, thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are his thoughts above mine. I can only see minuscule. But he sees the full picture. 
and he knows how this situation fits into his plans and his, and his purposes for my life. And therefore, God, I'm yielding to your will. I'm yielding to your higher purpose. I'm not going to worry myself over this situation. I'm going to just let you have your own way and do it the way it pleases you. And, that, and it is only in that place of rest, my sisters and my brothers, that you can endure the waiting season between when we ask and when the answer finally comes. Believe me, we have to be yielded to God. Surrender to him, especially when the waiting season is very, very long. I've been there. I have waited for, I waited 20 years from the day the cough started to when I eventually had the lung transplant. No coughing every single day nonstop for 20 years. You need to anchor yourself on the rock that will never shift because those anxious thoughts will come. The worrisome suggestion will come. The enemy will come and say, would you ever get out of this? I know people who labeled me. The woman with the cough, this is your cough. And each time they are saying it, I'm saying, it is not my cough. I don't have ownership over disease. I do not, this, this disease came. This affliction came upon me. I did not invite it. And therefore, it cannot be mine. And so when people say things that can, you know, open my heart up to anxiety, that can open my mind up to worrying about oh God, uh -uh, why me? One thing after the other. I quickly remind myself what God's word says concerning me and hold fast to that truth. And I'm sure I've shared it here many, several times, how I encouraged myself with the word of God. I pasted what the word of God says concerning me and put it everywhere in my room where I can see it so that I am not focusing my attention on the coughing, on the difficulty in breathing, on the, on, on the, on the challenges with my health. But I am you know, using the word of God at all times to counteract every symptom that I was feeling in my body. So we, 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 we acknowledge that, you know, when we surrender to God in a place of prayer, we are acknowledging that, you know, God has the total knowledge. We are limited in our knowledge. We are limited in our ability to change the situation. And if I know and I recognize that I'm limited in my ability to change the situation, I am limited in my knowledge even of the situation, even when it is in my face. I mean, I knew what the doctor says about the respiratory problem. I knew what the doctor says about the, 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 the neurological problems. But all of that is still limited in terms of what God is seeing. Because he sees all the picture. He sees the whole thing. He sees everything that is going on. And so when I, see God, when I recognize that my, 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 my power and my knowledge is limited, then I have to anchor my trust anchor my faith on the one who has unlimited knowledge and unlimited power to change the situation. You and I cannot change the situation, even if we worry from now till kingdom come. Our worry, our anxiety will not change the situation. Rather, it's going to worsen that situation and bring everything, you know, other things that we did not, you know, anticipate to, you know, to come along with it. So it is a readiness. We have to get to that state, that place where we have this readiness to accept whatever outcomes it's God brings into it, whatever outcome, whichever way God wants to go in this. I was sharing uh, 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 in that post that I got to a point when I, you know, I was just so angry when I see people, you know, at um, healing prayer, miracles prayer, uh, uh, services, and they just jump out of their wheelchair, they're running all over the place, and I'm still dealing with this issue. 10 years has passed, 12 years passed, 15, and then it was at that point, I think it was at the, when I got to the 12th year, and I was telling God, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, I mean, she, you know, you did it when, after 12 years. So this 12 year, this 12th year of this affliction is the year that everything must stop. 
And I was really so determined that it has to stop anyhow, you know, because Jesus, the woman with the issue of, of the blood went to Jesus, you know, at the 12th year and he, it, she touched the helm of his garment and he became whole. You see, God began to impress on my heart that you are unique. My timing, I will work everything in my life according to his timing and his purpose concerning me. And it will be all about his glory. In fact, he so, you know, chastised me for being angry for those who were getting instant healing. He said, instant healing and for those who are just coming to know him. I, I, he expects me to work out my salvation, work out my healing with the word. And that I sh if I am not ready to be happy for those who have what I want and I don't have it yet, then I'm not matured enough to have what I'm asking for. And, I've, you know, that really touched my heart because I have seen situations where people, you desiring something, you want it so much. And then when you see other people who are getting, having that thing that you want, you are angry, you are gutted, you, you are upset, you cannot be happy for them. So if you cannot be happy for the person who has that thing that you're desiring, then you're not matured enough. You're not qualified enough to have it. It says rejoice with those who rejoice. Be happy for those who are having it. While you are trusting God to act in your, in your own situation the way only he can do. And that is where our trust in God comes in. That he is sovereign. With whatever the outcome of what, this situation, God gets the glory. Ultimately, God will get the glory as long as we are steadfast in our trust, you know, to him, in him and we are willing to surrender to his purpose. We know that he will work all things together for our good. That situation that you are trusting God for, that situation you're praying about, you need to know that God will work it together for your good. That is his word. That is his promise. And he will, it is too faithful to go back on his promises. And you see, when we don't do that, when we don't keep God's promise in focus and we focus on the problems, on the issues, on what we are asking for that we don't have yet, when we begin to magnify it, because when you keep something in focus, it becomes so big, it, becomes, it magnifies before you. It's what you are thinking about morning, day, night. It is constantly on your mind. Yes, you are in pain, and that is going to be on your mind because your physical body is distressed. But we need to override it with the word of God because the more we focus on the pain, the more we focus on the distress, the more we focus on the problems, on all the issues that are going the way, we magnify it. Ultimately, if you are thinking about something and it is uppermost in your mind, that's what you are worshiping. It takes over. It becomes the center of your life. Before you know it, it is the problem that you are worshipping. It is what you talk about from morning to night. But God doesn't want to share the throne of your heart with your problems. And that's why I say, hand over the problems to me. And then he will sit on the throne of your heart and deal with it. They see, the more we focus on the problems, the more anxiety, anxious thoughts will grip our, our heart. In the verse that I read earlier, it says, anxious fears. And you begin to man, you know, imagine in your, in your heart. And the interesting thing is that if, when we let our minds go wild and just go off rain without being controlled, we imagine the worst case scenario. We keep thinking about the worst case scenario. But that is where we must exercise self-control by the help of the Holy Spirit to bring our heart mind back on track and keep the word of God in, in focus. The more anxious thoughts we entertain about the situation, the more doubts will come in, the more we get frustrated and we get tormented by all these anxious thoughts. Honestly, those anxious thoughts can be tormenting. I've been there. I know it. I remember a time way long ago, must be around 1992 or 1992, 1993. I can, I can remember exactly. I, mean, I think it's more like 1993. My husband had to travel, you know, on a project, you know, to the northern part of the country. And he had given a set date when he was going to come back. In those days, there were no mobile phones. So it's only where you can get to Nightel, you call, or you have the landline. And since he was traveling, he has to be able to get to Nightel, you know, to, to be able to call. 
but it was not within the vicinity of where they could, you could make a call back to say, no, the travel plan had had to change because they encountered some problems along the way. So I'm waiting for him to arrive on Friday night. He was not there. Okay, maybe they were delayed one day. So from mo the morning, the, the minute day broke in the morning, I was by the window. And this thoughts kept coming. Oh, yes, <laughs> something has happened. I mean, our mind always conjure up the worst case scenario. I was thinking of all the all possible accident, everything that could have gone wrong in that trip. To the point that I was so tormented with the anxious thoughts that I could not even sit down. I could not eat. I could not pray. Until I got to a point I said, I called myself to order. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Call your soul to order. So rather than sitting down here and moping and conjuring up all the worst things that could happen, let us start spraying in the spirit. We must be able to speak to ourselves and say, no, change the channel. My mind is not a garbage can for the enemy to sow seeds or to torment. I will not allow the enemy to torment me with my thoughts. So we need to bring our thoughts subject to the word of God. James chapter 1 tells us this. And it helps us to really focus our, our thoughts on the words and the purposes of God so that God can walk from the inside out to strengthen us with his grace. James chapter 1 tells us, I want to read that in a few um, translations. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Verse 6 to 8, chapter 1. It reads... If you don't know what you are doing, pray to the Father. If you don't know what to do, he loves to help. I'm reading this in a message translation. You will always get his help. And won't, he won't be considered, I mean, he will not be considered to when you ask for it. Ask boldly. Ask believing. Without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind wiped, you know, wind wiped waves. They are blowing like this. When you are worrying, this is how worry is tossing you up and down. Don't think that you're going to get anything from the, from the master that way. Because adrift in the sea, you're keeping all your options open. And you know, when I read that in the message, I'll read it in the New Living Translation for clarity. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. When you are praying, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver up and down. Would it happen? Would it not happen? For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from God. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in anything that they do. I see two lines, two phrases caught my attention when I read it in the past, in the um, message translation. I said, don't worry your prayers. Don't worry it. Don't keep going back to examine the seed that you have sown in the ground. There's no way that seed will ever grow. If you keep uprooting it to check whether it is growing roots, then you put it back and cover it, and then two days later, because you have not seen the, 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 the seed sprouting, you go back and open up the soil again and bring it out to check. <laughs> that seed is never going to grow because you are not giving it the time and the opportunity it needs for the roots to go down so that they sprout, it can sprout and come out. That is what happens when we worry our prayer, when we are anxious about the things that we are, we are asking God for. It's also like we are keeping our options open. When you're worrying, it's a, if God doesn't do it the way I want, I'm going to do one, two, three. So you have plan B. And you give God some time to do what he wants to do. If it doesn't go the way you want, then you are going to plan B. No, that's not the way to relate to God that we trust. If we trust in God, then we don't have plan B. We are entrusting it into God's hands and we are trusting him to take absolute control of that situation and work it together for our good and in accordance to the his purpose and will. We can't keep our options open in our relationship with God. We cannot say, if God doesn't do this the way I want it, then I'm going to do X, Y, Z. 
or I will go here to do somewhere else to do it. No, that is like being, you know, tossed around by, you know, by the, you know, gift. A, a, a gay force wind that blows the waves over you know, all up and down. Right. We need to believe in that God is willing. It says he is always willing to help. God loves to help us. He cares so much about us. He wants to help us. And so when he said we should ask him, we should ask trusting, we should ask believing, we should ask without doubting his ability to help us. He's willing to help us. He has the power to help us. If God does not have the power to help you, no other person under the sun can help you out of that situation. Let's just get that straight. Let's just get that right. If God does not have the power to change the situation, nobody under the sun can change that situation. You see, our feelings... Our emotions will tend to betray us. Yes, from the inside. And that's why we need to speak peace. The peace of God that passeth all human understanding. He guards our heart. It garrisons our heart against agitating fears. And that peace comes from trusting in God's ability to take care of that situation. So we choose to stick to God. We do not believe what our emotions tell us. No, when those our thoughts come, you, we, we, we silence them. We, we, even when you are feeling the pain, the, uh, the, 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 the heaviness of the problem, yes. And you say, I'm not going to focus my attention on this. I'm going to focus my attention on what God has said concerning this situation. And here's the thing that always comforts me. God, whose power raised Christ from the dead <laughs> and lifted him. To the heavenly places to be seated at his right hand is the same God that I'm calling to in prayer. He is the Father that I'm calling upon. And I, I, I so like that verse because I know that that same power that quickened Jesus Christ, that raised him up for the dead, is available to me. It's at work in my situation. And all those years when I was trusting God for my health, that was the word that I was using. That the power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in my body. It will quicken my body. That power cannot fail. It cannot fail. And it is, it, 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 God has made that power available to me. That is the reason why Jesus died. And the, 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 the work on the cross at Calvary, the finished work that Jesus did at the cross at Calvary, is not in vain in my life. It's not in vain in your life. And so we need to stand on the authority of that finished work. And say, yes, Jesus said it is finished on the walk on the cross at Calvary. And it's a perfect exchange that he did for you and I on the cross at Calvary. He gave his life for me. He delivered me. It was a package of salvation. It was a package of healing. Included in that package was deliverance. Included in that package is, 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 is blessings. He became cursed that I may be blessed. He became poor that I may be rich. The exchange is perfect. And so I'm going to keep speaking that into existence in my life. That is what I will allow to shape my thoughts. That is what will be shaped, I will allow to shape my words concerning that situation. I will not voice the anxious thoughts. I will not voice it. I will not give power to them. But I'm just going to trust that God who raised Christ from the dead by his mighty power will put that power in this, on display in my life. God will never betray us. It is impossible for God to betray his faithfulness to us. It is impossible for him to renege in his promises. And here is the thing. Matthew 6, 27 tells us, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Who of you, by worrying, can extend your life by even a minute? Not to talk of one hour. If they did, the, you know, you, you know, so worry will not, it, 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 it's something that, it's a habit that we must break. It is a spirit that we must bind. It is a spirit that we must bind. We must give up that habit. Our worrying does not add any value whatsoever to our lives. It depletes us of energy. It depletes us of, of joy. It depletes us of peace. It just sends us on, a, on, a, on an emotional journey of up and down, roller coasting, roller coasting, up today, down tomorrow, up today, down tomorrow. That is not the way God wants us to live. And we will see that even expanded further in Philippians chapter 4. 
Philippians chapter 4. Yeah, um, starting from verse 6, it says, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You see, I shared recently, I'm not, I think it was about last week, that God delights in every detail of your life. There is no detail of your life that you can take to God in prayer. There is absolutely nothing that concerns you that does not concern God. I have learned that if it concerns me, if it makes me agitated, it's going to God. Because that's what the Bible is telling me in Philippians 4 verse 6. That, you know, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all that he has done already. And you see, that is really one of the um, antidotes against worrying. Switch your mind to begin to thank God for what he has done. What he's done for you in times past. If you're somebody who keeps a prayer journal, go back to your prayer journal and look at how God has intervened on your behalf in times past. I mean, the, I think in the last three months, I have stumbled on prayer lists that I've made for years. But I think two weeks ago, my husband brought out a prayer list that we, I, I, I wrote. I mean, he was uh, clearing the study and I found this prayer list. It was on a white sheet of paper. And obviously from the prayers that I was asking for, I have to have written it around 2003. And I picked it up and I was going through all the prayers on that list and how God has accomplished it. And it just revived my hope. It just lifted my heart up. Ah, God who did this. There is absolutely nothing that is too hard and difficult for him to do. And it's, so, it's always good to keep a prayer list, you know, a prayer book where you enter what you're asking God for. And as we're entering the new year, it's a good time for us to do that. If you always have something to come back to, 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 to remind you of what God has done for you in time past. I, about a couple of months ago, I found another one that I wrote in 2010. And it really, you know, encouraged my heart to look back at those lists and see how far God has brought me. I am not the same person I was 10 years ago. I can testify of the faithfulness of God. And if God intervened on my behalf and kept me to today, uh -uh, that God has not gone on vacation. He has not gone on a, a war. He does not sleep. He does not slumber. He is still the same God today and tomorrow. The same God who kept you through 2020. Just consider what 2020 has been like for most people. Think about it. You're here listening to me. You can hear me. You, 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 your ears are working. Your eyes are functioning. You are breathing without assistance. How many people have been to ICU in this, in this, in this year alone that you know personally that have had to go to ICU and be assisted to breathe? And we have so much to thank God for. Thank him for what he has done. Take moments every day to look back into your life and just thank God. And the more you thank God, the more you dispel worry. Worry cannot stay where there is praise. I can assure you that. If you fill your atmosphere with praise, adoration of God's beauty and splendor, worry can't stay there because you are telling your heart that this God is mighty he, will take, he is able to take care of this situation, and therefore I will praise him for who he is. Where would you give room to worry there? Then, of course, worry cannot. And it says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that you can understand. And his peace will guard your heart and your mind and keep it in Christ Jesus. I want to read that for us in a couple of other translations. It is one Verse that, you know, no, you know, he encourages me, oh Lord, pray about everything. Talk to God like you, you know, the Bible tells us that Moses talked with God face to face as a, as a person talks to his or her friends. Talk to God, chat with him. I mean, you don't need to take any specific posture. If you can kneel down, yes. If not, no, go ahead. While you are washing, doing laundry, talk to God. You're cooking, talk to God. Practice the presence of God. If you're walking in the consciousness of God's presence every moment of each day, you can discuss with him all those things that troubles your heart. And you know and be assured that you, you know, God is listening to you. Because that is what his word says. 
You're walking along the road. You're driving. Talk to God. Converse with him. Have a conversation about that situation. It says, never worry about anything. But in every situation, let God know what you need in prayer. And request while giving thanks. Thankfulness must, re it must, it must precede and accompany every prayer, every request that we are making of God. Don't fret. Don't worry. Instead of worry, pray. And let praises shape your, your, your worry into, into prayers. Use praise to replace the worry. Praising God. You know, just consider the beauty of God, the one who created the entire universe and calls me his own. And he says that he wants to have a relationship with me, an intimate relationship with me. He calls me his father. He calls me his friends. He says that I am his beloved. And you just worship him for who he is, not just for what you want to get from him. You know, worshiping and for God is what we give to him, not, not for what we want to get from him. It's just lifting him up for who he is. And it says that when you lift him up, he will draw you unto himself. And when we praise God, we bring him into the situation. Look at what he did with Paul and Silas. As they pray and praise, <laughs> you know, I love the way one minister you describe it. He said, God got so caught up in their praises that he began to, you know, dance on his throne and he started tapping his feet. And as he was tapping his feet to the music of their praise, the earth shook. The earth quaked and the prison door flew open. Their shackles shattered and they were set free. We use praise to break the shackles of worry. That is what we do. We break the shackles of worry with praise. Instead of fretting and worrying, let us praise God. Let us praise him for who he is in the midst of whatever we are going through. And that peace that comes from his presence that no human being can understand, it will, it will control the way we think. It will shape our thoughts. And rather than having tormenting thoughts, we have thoughts of the goodness of God. We have thoughts of his faithfulness. And I mean, it, it, and that keeps these agitating thoughts, agitating fears far from our heart. God knows all that concerns you. He is all-knowing. There is absolutely nothing about you that is hidden from God. There is nothing that you're going through that God does not know about. And if he knows about it, I want you to be assured that he is working it out. When it seems everything is still and quiet, God is working. It is never on a break. He is working on that situation behind the scenes. And believe me, when he manifests the answer, <laughs> it will blow your mind. He will do it for his glory. He would do it that he gets all the honor. First Peter 2 says, give all your worries and your cares to God because he cares about you. Throw all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, throw it on God. He is the one who is most careful about you. He is watching over you with tender careness, you know, kindness. He is watching over you. He is concerned about everything that concerns you. And he cares about you with the deepest affection. There is no one who loves you as much as God. There is no one who cares about you as much as God does or who cares about that situation that is giving you concerns that you are worrying about as much as God. God cares more than you can ever care about that situation. Psalm 55, 22 says that, Psalm 55, 22 says, pile all your troubles on God's shoulder. All your concerns, all your worries, pile it up and put it on God's shoulder. He will bear the load. He will carry your load. He will help you out. That is the message translation. He will help you out. At the earlier we read that he is ever willing to help us. And he says he will never let good people be toppled into ruin. Throw your bodies on God. He will sustain you. 
You belong to God. You are God's child. You are his beloved. You can tell him all that worries you. Release the weight of your anxieties, the weight of the things that are bothering you. Release them into God's hands. He will carry it. You see, yeah, you know, there's this song that we learned when I was in the university. It says, give it to me, I'll bear it. Give it to me, I'll kill it. If there's a need in your life, I will take it if you only give it to me. Jesus said, give it to me, I'll bear it. Give it to me, I'll take it. If there's any need in your life, I will take it if you only give it to me. That's what God wants you to do. Give it to me. Jesus says, give it to me. Any need, any worries, any concerns, give it to me. I'll bear it for you. I will bear it for you. And as Psalm 55 continues to say, that the Lord will never let the person who is consistently righteous to be moved, to be upended, or to be made to fall or fail. Ultimately, we must understand that when we pray, it is not even about us. Even when we're praying about our needs, it's not about us. It's about God's purpose. It's about God's glory. Because God wants to glorify himself in our lives. He wants to show himself mighty on our behalf. That's what Second Chronicles says. Second Chronicles 6 to verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord must through and through the earth, that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely ease. Another translation says, For the eyes of the Lord run through and through throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are you know, perfect towards him. So that is what I have the responsibility to do. Make sure that my heart belongs to God completely, that I don't have plan B. I don't have anyone else I'm turning to. It is only him. There is no other option. It is him. And so when my heart is completely his, when it is perfect towards him, God, the Bible tells me that God is seeking to show himself mighty on my behalf. And that is the truth of God that you need to hold on to. In the midst of all that may be going on around about us, yes, that the season is different. Uh, Christmas may not be the way we usually do it. And oh, you're wondering how you're going to be able to do this, how you're going to be, do it, to, go, to, to be able to do that. You're going to have to trust God. And just entrust your life to him. Entrust the situation into God's hands. Entrust all your thoughts, all your worries into God's hands. He will seek it to show, he desires to show himself mighty on your behalf. He wants to show himself as the God who is your father. The God who is strong enough to carry you, to bear you. Come watch me. Just give God that opportunity to do it by trusting in him. There is no reason to worry our prayers. Because ultimately... It's never about us, it's about God's glory. It is about God demonstrating his power in our lives. He hears our prayers and he responds to them as we trust in him. He will respond to it in his own way. He will respond to it in his own time. And believe me, friends, his time is always perfect. He makes all things beautiful in his time. And that's why we cannot be double-minded. That's why we cannot be keeping all other options open. That's why we need to just keep our focus on God. Friends, trust God with your life. Trust God with your, your spouses. And trust your spouses into God's hands. And trust your children into God's hands. And trust your health into God's hands. And trust your finances into God's hands. Every detail of your life. And trust it into God's life, hands. After all, he is our faithful creator. He created us for his glory. He is the one who judges justly. If somebody has done you something that really hurts you, that is making you, you, know, you know, so hurt and pained in your heart, he, it is only God who can vindicate you. He is the one who can get the, court, the right justice for you. No court in the world can get you justice the way God will get you justice. And he will do it if you entrust that situation into his hands. God has a complete knowledge of you. He knows you inside out. He knows what bothers you. He knows what is worrying you. But he wants you to trust him to take care of it for you. He says, give it to me. I'll bear it for you. Give it to me. I'll take it. If there is a concern, a worry, a problem in your life, he says, bring it. Talk to me about it. 
and trust me to take care of it for you. So offload your bodies to God, friends. Offload all your anxiety. Pile it on God's shoulders. Pile it into Jesus' hands. Lay it at Jesus' feet and watch what he is going to do about it. Don't go back to take it back from him. Let him handle it. After all, can you, can you handle it? Do you have the power to make a change in that situation? No, not you, not I. But we can trust God who has the power, who is the almighty to take care of that situation for us. I pray that these words will encourage you tonight, that this word of truth will bring encouragement, hope and joy to you. And as we go into Christmas season, that the joy of the season will guard you, will flow over you, over your homes. It will show in your visage that you are trusting the God who will never fail, who gives you joy, no matter what the troubles are. Ponder on this and let the Holy Spirit give you deeper insights in Jesus' name. Thank you for this time. God bless you as you meditate on it. Have a restful night. Good night and God bless you.